Doesn't matter. Oh, there's Teresa as well. Hi, Hi Teresa. Hi. Hi. Very good. Okay, I think we start with the session. It's called Guide and Champion Networks, Coalitions of Learning in the Learning Organization. What is it and uh, what does it do? And I would like to start with a little introduction. How did we came up with the whole topic? Why these kinds of networks, whatever they are called, might be a, a thing, an issue. And I invited some people from organizations where now know that they have such kind of networks. Uh, and we would like to talk then in the second two thirds or half of the session a little bit about the concrete activities and also the, the pains and the gains, like what's working well, what's working not so well. And I would like to start a little bit. We have a small discussion here before the session started about Cotter. Uh, some said, oh, there's this Cotter book. Uh, I used it in my, in my studies. And what's, what's interesting to see is that th this Cotter book that you see on the left, uh, for the ones who are here, we have them here. Uh, this, this is, does anybody know from what year this is? 96. 96? It's 96. But I just looked it up on your concept. <laughs> <laughs> You're a cheater. I'm a cheater. You're a cheater. Uh, right. Just as one remark for you online, if you click on our camera picture with the right, ma ma right mouse click and then choose fit to frame, then you see the full camera of the room. Because with the room cameras, always right and left is cropped otherwise. Just as a tip if you if you want to see all, everybody who's in the room. Yeah, like uh, Simon guessed very well, it's from 96, but still when people are complaining about old school change management and so on, they refer to this book. Totally ignoring that there are two new ones. Uh, one is called Accelerate, like uh, how can I lead change in an ever accelerating world, all this VUCA stuff and so on. And then the new one, which is called uh, Change with the subtitle, how organizations achieve hard to manage results in uncertain and volatile times. And uh, I think a lot of people are still working with these eight steps of change, which have a very linear approach, like uh, uh, S is status and a to B status, and then I have to go from A to B, and I have to have like 20 change agents, and then the change project is finished. And uh, this is why I would like to introduce some of the ideas that, that came with the newer books, especially with Accelerate. There's a very, very good video uh, on YouTube. I don't play it here, but I suggest that you play it afterwards. Uh, I would post it in, in the chat then. Uh, called uh, Accelerate. The evolution of the 21st century organization. Uh, I turned down the volume. Very uh, explains in a very uh, graphical manner why uh, Organizations that are organized in a strictly hier uh, hierarchical format are not very uh, well performing in the dynamic age of the 21st century. And he came up with this basic idea uh, of the so-called dual operating system that organizations try to start to fix problems in the hierarchy by uh, starting task forces and networks and everything which just connect to the hierarchy. Uh, and what John Cotter says is that the basic idea is that you have to manage somehow to have the, the formal organization and the informal organization on an eye level and have to manage that system. It's not just the sidetrack, the informal organization and the networks, but they have to uh, get more on the main stage. And when you look to the, uh, at the, uh, the World Economic Forum, they bring up every year to the uh, event a study with the CEOs where they ask them, what do they think uh, are the key success factors for their own organizations to be successful in the next decade? Uh, then their one result this year was that shifting the focus from the formal to the informal, not like 100 to zero, but shifting about 10 to 20 percent more to the informal side uh, is sort of the average. To have more in, in terms of your time, uh, Gus is already shaking his head. This will be a good discussion yeah. afterward. To have as an employee time to spend in communities and networks, go to bar camps, learn together, which is not related to your department or your project or your line work that you have. Um, so in this book, uh, he came up with the observation that in, in organizations, with the tr trouble zooming, 
in organizations, the, the right side of this dual operating system does not pop out automatically. There should be called, um, um, a group of people orchestrating it. And uh, in the English book, Cotter calls this leading coalition. And the basic idea of the leading coalition is to be sort of the connection between the top management on the formal side and the networks and communities on the other side to perhaps have an idea for which communities do we need a management sponsor? Could this be? Uh, how can we get in the contracts of the employee formal time to spend in these communities, things like that? Uh, but also have an idea what are the topics on the directions top management want to go, where we don't have a community or a network yet, but it would be a good idea to have that. So in the book, there's sort of a, uh, a task list, uh, what this coalition uh, might do. And for the Lenoir's for Organization Guide, we just renamed this gray circle here a little and, and call this uh, uh, learning coalition, not leading coalition, because in German leadership and Führung is a lot of organizations somewhat difficult. And we said uh, the, the basic vision of this coalition, which is interdisciplinary, should be the development of the learning organization, the sort of the twist in the, in the learners organizations life. And uh, what we did then, is this picture here? I moved the, uh, the post its to the side. Um, sorry, it is only available in German so far. But this comes also on the, on the one hand, the, the lower part here, the army of volunteers comes from Potter. So in the Accelerate book, he says it's not sufficient anymore to have a topic and have this typical 20 change agents for that. But you need to have a critical mass of people, which is like 10% of the organization, and he calls that army of volunteers. And this army of volunteers should not be the change engines for one topic, like implementation of uh, Microsoft 365 is one change engine network, and implementation of new work style is another, and implementation of hybrid work is another. But this army of volunteers form a network that thrive this bigger change with all these subtopics inside. And these are typical. Uh, at Audi, for example, or at Sydney Setsenius, also the Conti guys, uh, it's around, I think you're around 1,400 people, 800 people, 1,000 people. It's like a percent of the organization or something like that. But more uh, like this 20, 20 people. Uh, what we kind of stole when you have been uh, in the, in the uh, two years ago in the Lenovo's convention, we had um, the guy from Open Space Agility doing a talk uh, and, and what he suggests to, what is his name? On is it a Gary? You're the main profile. Pardon? You're always the main guy. Yeah, yeah normally, Open Space Agility. It's too hard to remember names. Um, it's kind of this framework. It's, from my perspective, one of the one of the cooler frameworks to, to implement uh, agility in an organization. And the basic idea here is to uh, implement agility by sprints, doing sprints, uh, taking a quarter or 100 days here uh, and have uh, some challenges, people who prepare experiments. Uh, there's already, if you can see this here, already organizational learning as, as part of the concept here, even if the agile manifesto is on top. And then the, the idea there is to have an ongoing process of events, which uh, they call open space uh, meetings or open space agility meetings, to drive that forward. So the basic idea to have a regular process to, to drive change, uh, that this army of volunteers can come together. So what we did in the Lanners Organization Guide is to, to place this North Star of the learning organization on top, uh, having this open space process here. Uh, in the middle and have the guiding coalition here on top, like going from today to the future and placing this coalition of learning as kind of translator between the top management and the strategic vision and where do we want to go on the one hand, and then the concrete problems, struggles in the daily work the employees have on the other hand. So when I go to someone from the Audi board saying, it's important that employees are able to manage Teams channel in a proper way or manage hybrid meetings in a proper way. The, the board member doesn't have any open ear for me. But if, if I talk about like this could be a contribution to uh, 
get in the competition before Tesla or be better than BMW, or we can uh, reduce time to market time by 10% due to better collaboration and this network helps us, then they listen to it. So the story to the entry is a totally different story than the story to the top management. And sort of this translation is also part of the task of this guiding coalition. We will talk about that later. I, I put some, uh, some examples here. Like from my perspective, what the Comte guides are doing is, is somewhat kind of a of, of such a coalition because you also have people from uh, different departments and different dis disciplines, and you do nowadays different stuff than back then when you had Connex. Uh, the Audi sets uh, uh, collaboration to zero guides. Set stands for Zusammenarbeit 2.0. Or also Teresa and Christian is here from the Digital Together Champions at Siemens Health News. So these are kinds of such interdisciplinary networks, uh, which of course have core teams who run stuff, similar to a department. You need people who drive stuff, who organize events, who also do onboarding of new members. So there are people going away and others coming, or there are sleepers, people who are not active anymore, and you have to activate them somehow. And of course, you have a lot of regular activities, like events, like meetups, like communities, and so on. And I think this is also one, one common thing that there are, similar to this open space approach, one flagship event per year where you bring together a lot of people who are interested in that topic. Well, this is in, uh, at Audi, for example, we, have, we had since 2015 the collaboration to Zero Bar Camp twice a year, once in Ingolstadt, once in Neckarswollen. Uh, then with the pandemic, we started the uh, collaboration to zero Digicon, which was a, a digital format only with this year, like 32,000 uh, people joining the sessions. So you have a much bigger reach. And now we switched to have one, one in virtual format and one in a physical format or a hybrid format. The Barcamp will become a hybrid one. And also the Digital Together Summer School and the Barcamp that we plan for, uh, for autumn in, in uh, Erlangen is such an example. And uh, just as last input that I brought with me, since we had him uh, also two years ago at the LOSCON, uh, this is a picture also so far only available in, in uh, German. A uh, basic idea of how you can think of the structure of so, such a coalition. Uh, what I think is important to have a, a strong core team at the center, similar to what Tanya yesterday said of a community, you can start with three or four. To believe have a lot of people, then it's more like 10 or 15. Uh, but these are the people who are really committed, perhaps who also have part of the time of their job, like this typical five to 10%. Uh, you're a developer in the R&D department or so, but you have some time to spend on organizing an event or doing an onboarding process. You, you can't rely on people who do it from uh, six to seven in the evening because people burn out and are not motivated anymore and so on. Uh, you have to have a clear idea what the concrete practices are, like what is this new kind of working that we want to put in place, which in my perspective is a little bit problematic in the last years in this whole new work thing, because for uh, the one group of people it's working remotely, for the others it's knowledge work, for the others it's asynchronous work, for the others it's agile, so it's really, really Diffuse, diffuse and diverse bunch of topics that you have to kind of order and to say, okay, who are our target groups? Do we want to change the way how leaders lead or project managers manage projects or communicators communicate? And what are the patterns to have a, a, a concrete content? And then normally, uh, I like this in, in Joel's picture, this community of practice circle. You have people in the organization who actively say, we are interesting, interested in that. We want to adapt this new kinds of working, which he calls a community of practice. They learn from each other. They share news. Here's this new feature in Teams. Uh, here's a new method to moderate a hybrid workshop and so on. So uh, they are very uh, active. Uh, typically, in the case of Siemens Hazenius and Audi as well, and Conte, I think, too, uh, these are communities in the enterprise social networks, like in connections or in Jive or in, in Yammer, we the engage. Uh, and then he had this, this outer circle, like this community of interest, uh, where he says, okay, these are people who say, oh, this sounds kind of interesting, but perhaps it's not for me yet, or 
I just want to lurk around, come to a meetup, but don't come to the bar cap yet. You know, and the basic idea of the core team is to be like a black hole, you know, to have to attract people to come from the I don't even know what this coalition or this topic is to oh I'm interested uh, I join the meetings I watch the recordings I go to the bar camp to oh I'm a practitioner I'm doing that I'm getting better I influence others colleagues in my department in my project and perhaps also saying okay I think this is so important for the future of my organization I want to become part of the core team or also decentralized you know, core teams that are in, in different um, regions. Uh, if you uh, distribute it globally, it's a good idea to have a core team at least for each uh, continent or for each country or so. Because the, no? time zone is, a, is an issue. Yeah, right. Mm. right. So this is sort of a, a kind of an, an input for the beginning of the session. And I would like to discuss this with you, of course, uh, ask questions, criticize it, uh, other opinions. But also from the people who are there who have such networks, perhaps a little bit input about these pains and gains thing. Like, does that resonate with you? Uh, what are the things where you say, okay, this is absolutely essential if I start, start such a kind of thing? Or also, these are things we try since three years, but it's not working, or we struggle with that for for a long time. So if you're here in the room, just raise your hand here. If you're online and want to contribute something, then uh, raise your hand online in Teams. I have an eye on you. Should I give you the, the mic? And we switch to Kerstin. Thank you. Uh, I have a clarification question. What's the practice in this context? How big, how small is it? Uh, just an example or two. Yeah, yeah, true. Do you mean this one here? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for example, what we're discussing in the core and Audi is what does the what does the principle open by default mean for the daily work of an engineer? And the concrete practice is when I start something or do a presentation where I started in my OneDrive and then I present it and then I send out a PDF via email. <laughs> or do I start it in open space and all the content is available in the whole company publicly. Everybody can download the PowerPoint or the presentation is in the wiki page. Uh, I can add information and enrich it. Uh, this is such kind of practice, closed, closed working versus open working. Uh, also for communicators, we did this as Siemens has in years, like for the role of a communicator, uh, do I communicate with a top-down mindset, like the board said, here's the news, eat or die, uh, or I, do I do it in a way that I want to have two-way communication? that there's a call to action, that there's a link to a Yammer community post where you can interact. So this sort of, I'm not sure if, if perhaps you have known of the book Atomic Habits. Is that, does, do you, have you known about it? Uh, I just uh, share it because I think this is very, we, we work with that a lot. And I also like, like the title. Um, so the basic, basic idea here is that Change happens step by step with small changes in behavior. That's why if you listen to John Stepper, for example, why did he do this working out loud thing? Not in a two-day seminar, but in a 12-week program. It's because you have to take small steps each at a time and change it. And we try to sort of have this learning pathways for the different roles where you can say step by step, I get this, uh, uh, one step further and um, skill up myself, so to say. But mm. this is this enough as, a, as an example? Yeah, for now, yeah. Something like the 1% method. Yeah, 1%, Stefan said this 1% method, yeah. I think we agree that it's like that. Okay, anyone else? Yeah, yeah maybe I can continue. Um, so also to this circle, I don't know if there's a specific name of this model that you showed there on the right that we just referred this, yeah. to again yes yeah it's uh it's... yeah this is uh I, I put it i thought i put it uh, mm -hmm. in the link it's uh Schul Graf, and we have the video mm -hmm. link from two years ago and it's called change coalition mm -hmm. interesting yeah i i can also tell from the practice that this is that this is very true i would even say that the the community of interest is way bigger 
than the community of uh, of practice. So we experienced, so for example, with our guides, so we have about 1,200 and we experienced that we have, yeah, a very strong core team. So who are more the regional representatives and who were there to, to support or to organize those hybrid events and this upskilling that we did last year. And then we see that we have an active community. Um, in this case, we could call it the community of practice who are there, who join the calls, who um, join the initiatives, try out the new tools and features. I would say that these in our case are about three to maximum 400. And the rest are really the those listeners. So I sometimes also say this is where for me comes also the differentiation between the community and the network where I would, I would dare the person you ask in this network would say, yes, I'm a guide, but probably is not the one who is there or who raises the hand when uh, we have certain tasks. So this, um, yeah, is really true, this, this model in this sense. And what I found interesting, Simon, what you said with the, uh, with this coalition, so the ones who are kind of the link to the management, um, who are there to try to get more commitment, more official capacity for the role to bring in this network idea. Uh, I think this is very important. And I also think the biggest challenge uh, to go in this direction. What, what do you say is the biggest challenge? Uh, you were talking about this, uh, co the coalition, so kind of the link to the management yeah. um, who are there to more fight for this network or for the community. Uh, to get official capacity to bring in this network idea. Yeah. And this is a big challenge. And at the same time for us, so what we focus on at the moment is really the yeah, classical stakeholder management because we figured out that we were too much into our community network thinking, believing yeah. in our oh. enterprise social network is there everywhere. Yeah. But we figured out we need to talk more directly to the people to with yeah. some power and this is the the focus we put on at the moment. Link to the management. I think Jan has this hand raised in a minute. Uh, with the link to the management at Audi, for example, the management sponsor is the CIO. Uh, he learned with the implementation of enterprise social network that's a really effective way to manage the change and adoption of the tool. And he said we want to never implement a new system in another way than, than this way. And now it spreads via the or across the different brands. So the network uh, will be implemented next year at Volkswagen and at MAN and so on. But you're sort of stuck in this IT bubble. There are only people who want to implement or adopt systems. And it's, uh, now we are in search of people in the HR department, for example, who care in the better normal program about hybrid work or four hour, a four day work week or stuff like that. That's not the business of the CIO. So over the time, the, also the, the management sponsors, I think, have to broaden or become interdisciplinary to have connections to not just this one IT department. Sorry for the interruption. Jan, up to you. Yeah, I, I wonder actually, especially exactly this sponsorship thing. So I, I, I do, I can see that such a model working in an organization where there is top-down empowerment of such a cross-organizational group, especially in hierarchical organizations. And I wonder if that isn't given and not even a CIO, like in your example case, how realistic is that something like that can emerge or is it really like a, a top-down first, you know, <laughs> rather big size investment to happen in order that such a thing can evolve on a, on a corporate scale, I would say. Yeah. Where IT, HR and all the different departments are really kind of working together in such a coalition as a core team, cross-function. Yeah. yeah. Well, perhaps we make a short round. I can tell the story at, at uh, Audi and from some other organizations. At some organizations, it starts like this first dancer video. I don't know if, if yeah. you saw that, this guy dancing strangely on a hill and a lot of people changing and you've got sort of a movement. But often these movements die after two or three. Those guys are there are stoned, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you need to smoke something. Yeah. That's the difference. 
uh, and Audi, the starting point was the uh, implementation of Enterprise to Zero, like wikis, video portal internally, enterprise social network, where we saw that we can't implement this with uh, normal trainings or communication. And this network was, was built. And the critical thing was to keep it sustained after the project was finished. Because the thinking in the organization is, we implement this Enterprise to Zero thing, it's three years. Uh, there's budgets, there's full-time equivalents, there's a project lead, there's a reporting line, uh, there's a, a, a management committee having an eye on the project. But when the project is finished, they have totally other topics on their list, so to say. And this was a critical half year talking about after the end of the project, how does that become line work? And some of you, I think, know Anke Wendelken, who had a uh, a full-time job running that network and we had others who had 20% or 40% of the time uh, and now Anke um, went on Mutterschutz, what is it in English? Maturity. Maturity leave, perfect. And this was also a critical point if the organization replaces the person because there's a total stop of uh, hiring and this was a critical thing because there were a lot, a lot of people arguing, okay, we do that for such a long time, can't, can't this be self-sustained? And the answer is no, if there's nobody, like if there's no project lead, there's no project running. Uh, it's similar to said. Yeah. yeah, okay, similar. <laughs> yeah, so at, at how much person from the lever? So I'm, I'm sorry for jumping in there. Um, so because you said, uh, so I was uh, looking very critical related to the so switch from hierarchy to uh, to networks. And and Kotter, of course, is always like good selling because he, my perspective has a very um, mechanical view of organization still. And then you mentioned, yeah, you have to shift not everything to, to um, networks, but maybe, I don't know, 10, 20 percent, that would be nice. And this is, of course, an ultimate mechanical view of organizations. It's really funny. But what would you say, like, from your feeling, at, at, at what, how much percent of the lever um, shift to the network side? would be uh, enough uh, to have it sustainable without Anki. Would it be 30 percent, 50? That's difficult to, to say. If I look at my, my uh, Sportverein, uh, sports community, there are since two decades always the three people who organize the tournament each year. And if you don't have these three people, there won't be a tournament. And uh, I think this is a similar thing like that. To have Stan Garfield on at the Knowledge Camp two or three years ago said, if you want to run the successful knowledge management approach in a medium to large size organization, you need to have at least one full time person who cares for it. In German, there's this word Beauftragter, uh, the, per, the delegate, the person who, whose topic is this. And if you don't have that, then, then it becomes difficult. After that, if you have five or 10 or 15, I think it's very different for each, each organization. Do you want to jump in on that? But because uh, Teresa raised her hand for quite a while, or uh, if you want, Teresa. Well, yeah, but it was more more generic. Uh, my my, what I wanted to to add, and it was uh, the perspective now from the from the champions that are very similar yeah, to the guides. Go ahead. No, they are very. It is very very similar as as the guides uh, network, and I think that. Uh, what what Steffi said that there was a the community of practice. Uh, I call them the spectators mode. <laughs> we have uh, these spectators uh, group. We have the uh, great core uh, members. Uh, I I see that Christian is there. I don't know if Meike is also there as well. Um, and then we have a larger community. And being a, a group of volunteers, it gives it provides a lot of value. But for the other hand, and this is something that you already stated, it's about rather than engagement, which is also an important pillar and something that we have to create the commitment. Uh, members, people are committed to their tasks, to their roles, but not uh, they they really struggle to commit to uh, a volunteer community. So we uh, what we see is an sporadic. Um, they they jump in and jump out mainly into the, the, the sessions that, that we provide. So from my perspective, the difficulty is to maintain and to have um, a work stream and um, making sure 
that the volunteers are going to com to commit. There is where the, 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 the roles of the management and the involvement of management, of course, uh, plays a, a very important role and also talking properly to the managers, um, converting our, our speech into managers speech. No, what is the, 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 the results that or the value of the community? And here also I, I find other two difficulties, which is we are in like in a blind way because this is something that the thing that there are um, people committed, people not committed, engaged, uh, spectators, uh, core teams, is about the numbers, but we don't know exactly what our members are doing in their teams, if they are really applying that, if they are being active, it's very difficult to track that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that, that, that would be mainly what, what, what I'm feeling. And also another part for me that is something that we struggle is how to provide a good way of, in a global network, how we can uh, provide a good way of networking and find the match between uh, members that have use cases, have solutions, members that would need support in a very organic way. That would mm -hmm. be my, yeah. my perspective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What comes to my mind when you say this is, I think, a very old paper of a colleague of yours. Uh, called social collaboration metrics, and there's an approach inside. It's called ICOP model, uh, and I like this very much because the um, it's sort of a pyramid, and the ICOP stands for at the, the P is the platform, uh, the uh, use the user engagement. What are they doing? Uh, then you have connectedness as a result and impact as top of the pyramid, and. The argumentation sort of is that on the lower levels of the pyramid, you can measure very well. You can say how many people are using Microsoft Teams, how many chats do they have, does this reply to email and so on. Uh, and you can have all this user engagement metrics in backends of Microsoft 365 and so on. You also can measure connectedness. I remember a study you did uh, connectedness uh, cross business units or something, cross countries. Uh, but then when it comes to impact, do we sell more products? Are we more innovative than the competitor? These metrics doesn't say a lot. And there you're on the level of stories of qualitative like testimonials and so on, uh, where we at Audi, for example, at the Audi bar camp, when we started the Audi bar camp in 2015, managers were asking, what is the value of sending 150 people for one day on a bar camp? They, they are calculating like how many hours is this? How many money does that cost? What's the ROI? And we, we started in the, at the second bar camp to screen all the 20 sessions that we have. And we kind of followed some sessions and tried to get, uh, to get impact stories out of it. So for, for example, one community that came out of, a, out of the bar camp was an exchange, was the Audi Tauschbörse, it's in German, it's like an Audi eBay, where you can say, we ordered this measurement equipment for 200,000 euros. We needed that for the A4 project. Now the A4 project is done. We don't need this, this uh, measurement instrument anymore. Now it's in our, uh, in our box, in our case. And they put it there and said, we have this equipment. Does anybody need that? Because we, we realized that a lot of people are buying the same stuff, very expensive stuff, but also small stuff like merchandise article and so on and, and folders. And we monitored this for a year and we had an ROI that was tenfold for one bar camp only with this Audi Tauschbörse, which came out of one session. And this was a story where we could tell, okay, if this is only out of the one session and everybody said, which we could measure with the NPS, this was a great event. I have a lot of new contacts, like more on the connectedness level. Management was more and more convinced that this is a good thing to have without us having to calculate it up down to the last euro. And I think similar was your, uh, your argumentation in the techno web. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so, so, so um, connectedness as a, as, a, um, as a metric is very uh, uh, plausible as long as you think that, that more connectedness in your organization is a good thing, right? It's like the years, it's, oh, sorry, it's like the years before where you said, um, more communication is a good thing, okay? And now we changed like, okay, more connectedness 
uh, connectedness a good thing and coming from knowledge management, certainly not reinventing the wheel 10 times or eight times, <laughs> then it's a good idea to have connectedness. And I think we're still in a phase in most organizations where we could say more connectedness would, would uh, be the closest metric to the business value, but closer you, you can't get in a general way. What we did with TechnoVet was something different. So we measured really, it was calculated um, with urgent requests. So it was only the functionality of one guy saying, I'm stating, I have a problem. And, and if you solve this problem, it would have a business impact of, I don't know, 50,000 euros and so on. Um, and that was the guy who, who asked the question saying, that would help me to sell a product or to solve a problem for a customer. And, and, and that worked pretty well. And of course, we did the, the measurement was built in. And that's a way of special kind of connectedness, solving urgent problems where you can, can put some business value. Yeah, in. Yeah. So it's business impact, it's not net, net yeah. income in the end. What, what we tried was some organizational network analytics. Mm -hmm. So we tried to, to map the complete organization, but not down to the personal level because of, you know, uh, you, 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 uh, no data security, data protection reasons. So we accumulated, let's say, the top organizational parts, and we took um, participation in teams, because mm -hmm. that's a quite easy group thing you can read. And if you map this, you can map your complete organization. So you see if an organization is connected to which other organizational part, if you accumulate that from bottom to yeah. the top levels. And you can see what organization parts are in the center. You can see what organization parts are at the edge of your organization, kind of, you know, on themselves and not so much yeah. interacting with others. And <clears throat> but what we could not deliver was then the connection toward business impact. Okay. Yeah. But what we what we can tell them for sure is if your goal in your organization is to to merge two departments, you should start where they are already. Mm -hmm. in terms of communities or in terms of teams um, where, where they already participate, because that's the connecting, that's the overlap of mm -hmm. those two. And engagement there or increased engagement there would then also engage or, or bring more collaboration of those two departments. Yeah. That's something we can prove um, from, from what we see, yeah. but we could not deliver you know, a, a real business yeah. value. Perhaps you can elaborate a little bit. In the last five minutes, I saw that you put the Vitesco case from your side, yes. in contrast to the Barcam at Audi, for example, or the Barcam at plant at Siemens, where more the new work, knowledge work guys meeting each other on your event, like R&D stuff is meeting each other, and you're much closer to- Yeah, that's the experts. It's not, yeah, not yeah. pure R&D, I'd yeah. say. So it's like the, that's the expert community. So all the officially nominated experts, so they have hierarchic levels, L1, 2, 3, um, where they where they are organized and basically the leading person came to me and asked what what kind of um, better improved bar camp could we do and you know we, we talked about this and we created this kind of idea of using spatial chat um, for this so yeah we looked into different tools and at the end it was spatial chat uh, which is a tool that has a kind of proximity feature in terms of audio so you have a surface where you can move your avatar and if you get close to somebody you will hear him or her and 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 it created a kind of uh, more connectedness than they had in the bar camp sessions that we purely managed on teams before because this stumbling into someone and have a chat about something uh, was is not that easy in a in a very siloed structured team organized event so it, it was basically a mixture of it. So we've had special chat parts and we've had also parts um, of the presentations that were purely in teams because of you know intellectual property uh, yeah, reason. Um, so and, and I, yeah, we wrote down what, what went good, what went not so good, let's say. So for example, good was the, the, the lounge or the birds of a feather sessions were received very well. So they were quite nice. So there were two groups discussing two different things in the same room. And they could switch by just dragging their avatar from one corner to the other, similar if you would move from like this room to the next corner. room. Yes. And so that 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 were people like that a lot. And you could really see when you went in it, 
that there were groups, yeah, yeah, putting together in one corner and were talking there. So that was really nice. Um, and the exchange and this uh, interactions were, were much more natural in, in, in that tool as, as it was a Teams, obviously. Uh, and it was very intuitive. So coming to you, we, we did some introduction session for it. So it was not that it worked for 100%, but it, no. in terms of tool setup, there were some challenges. But once they had set it up, it, for them, it was kind of yeah, very natural and, and understandable how that tool works. And there was no special yeah. training needed. Like if I would compare it to mind test, for yeah. example, then yeah, that's yeah, the yeah. difference. <laughs> um, what, what of course was not received that well was the, the tool change. Okay, so um, they would have liked to stay in that one tool, but because of, you know, uh, data security, data protection reason, we decided not to do this. Um, and uh, yeah, and then I think the, the, there was also the part of the main stage and there were some issues there. I'm not in the details there, um, but there was some audio, I don't know, uh, things that did not work that well. So, but overall, from their perspective, it was a, a nice, way of, of changing the setup and yeah let's see how they want to do it next time but it, i think from my perspective from, from the feedback i had it was successful yeah and i think it's also a good approach to um and how do we documented how we run the bar camp in the wiki with all the templates and all after after each bar camp we do a uh, lessons learned podcast with all the experiences and from that for example emerged the autonomous driving bar camp and, and they have a community where everybody is inside the whole, uh, the whole um, like across brands. There are also people from Volkswagen, from Porsche, and so on, uh, who work on autonomous driving cars. Mm -hmm. And they run a bar camp, and they just adopted that pattern of doing an event in a new way. They had a very old school, like uh, talk-driven format, uh, with a lot of boring stuff, and so on. And they like this interactive approach a lot. And I think for this. Guiding coalition, bringing these new formats, doing this not only for the own topics, but bring that to the core processes, whatever the core processes are, is a good way to uh, let these new work styles adopt also also there and yeah. socialize this knowledge. Just want to add one thing because we've talked about IT projects and so on. Um, yet some weeks or months ago, I think I got contact from several uh, projects that had implementation topics that were not IT related. So more like yeah, standard changes and no. No, it was part was tool, but more like was process related stuff. And they remembered this one big Office 65 project and remembered how the, the communication was there and they uh, tried to implement it. But in the end, yeah, budget and other reason prevented that to happen again. No. But it's, it's still not seen in all places as, as relevant as it's seen in IT. No. All right, we have two minutes left and not so much input from remote. If anybody of the remote people wants to say something as final words or final thought, then you might go ahead. Otherwise, we have a minute of silence. No, no pressure. Yeah. Any last thoughts here in the room? Okay. Thank you. So I hope it's well fine for you. Thanks for joining.